So good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Matt Stringfellow. I'm a Herman's critical care paramedic, and it's a great pleasure to speak to you all tonight about PEA. So as we've already said, the talk is going to be surrounding the evidence for pre-hospital um, termination of PEA. So the background, sort of where are we approaching this from, I think is really important to start with. So we're talking about out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and we're focusing on what is going to be presumed medical cardiac arrest, where a patient remains in PEA despite um, at least 30 minutes of ALS. We're looking at adult patients, and the decision really we're kind of framing this evidence around is, do we transport this patient to hospital who remains in PEA despite ALS? Or is it safe to terminate resuscitation on scene? And I'm sure looking down the list of everyone attending, we're all from very sort of wide variety of clinical backgrounds and organisations. So it's important to remember our own sort of organisational SOPs. But I'm hoping throughout the next sort of 40 minutes, you'll be able to reflect on your own current past and hopefully future practice and how this um, potentially relates to you at work. So in the UK, we roughly resuscitate around 30,828 patients per year in the pre-hospital environment. And the patients who we're focusing on tonight, really, are the patients where we do not really achieve a ROSC and that patient remains in PEA. And as you can see from here, patients who do not achieve a ROSC but are transported to hospital or do not have a ROSC by arrival at hospital is roughly around 6,850 per year. And quite sort of concerningly, really, and there's obviously lots of national initiatives to improve this, but 259 of those survived to discharge and 6,043 died in hospital of patients who were conveyed but did not have a ROSC. So really, these are the patients that we're talking about tonight, patients who remain in PEA, who we do not have a ROSC, and we really need to make a decision, are we conveying? or is it safe to, to stop resuscitation efforts on scene? But what we need to be mindful of is that there was 14,960 patients who resuscitation was terminated on scene. And what is vitally important is that we do not miss any patients who potentially could have survived with good neurological um, recovery. So a good way to frame um, PEA clinical decision making is with the Knevin framework, which some people may have come across before. And this is a really good um, way of, of kind of categorizing decisions in sort of human factors and ergonomics. So a task or a decision that's clear would be something like taking a BM. It's a very straightforward procedure. We do the same procedure each time and it's very straightforward. There's not really much decision making involved. A task that we could consider as complicated would be something like endotracheal intubation, where there's a number of steps. There's certainly more decision making involved, but the majority of times we follow the same steps in that procedure. Whereas something that we would consider complex is something that's multifactorial. There's lots of different competing sort of clinical questions and priorities. And that probably is where PEA currently sits. Um, and when we start to explore the evidence, that will hopefully become more clear. And I think the main sort of, if you don't take anything away, the main quote really should be, there's no always and there's no never, because this does require a nuanced clinical decision that each patient is going to be very different. And I think when we start to look at the evidence, hopefully that will become more clear. So what does GERCALC currently recommend? So GERCALC themselves recommend and highlight that the evidence surrounding PEA currently is limited. We don't particularly know that well which patients will survive and which patients won't. GERCALC recommend a few kind of clinical characteristics that we could consider when deciding which patients are suitable for further resuscitation or which patients may well not benefit from continued resuscitation in the pre-hospital environment. And quite importantly, GERCALC recommends that clinicians should share their decision with a senior clinical decision maker if clinicians on scene believe that further resuscitation attempts over 30 minutes would be futile um, in the patient's best interests for survival. So how can we as, as pre-hospital practitioners have a good understanding of the evidence base to inform our decisions as to when we may recognise futility in a patient who remains in PEA after 30 minutes of ALS. So what do we really mean by 
futile and what really is a successful outcome from cardiac arrest. So futility is essentially described as where an intervention has little or no prospect of achieving its intended aim or purpose. And furthermore, when potentially a patient will not benefit from those interventions. So when we've resuscitated a patient, they're not responding to treatment. And actually, is it within their best interest to continue resuscitation? In some patients, as we know, if they're at the final stages of a long-term incurable disease process that we know they will not survive from, is it actually within their best interest to continue resuscitation? And that may well be futile. And equally, what's more interesting, and certainly through looking at this research, what do we actually mean by a successful outcome from cardiac arrest? And I think it's something that is very personal to that individual patient. So this study here is really interesting, as you can see on the right side of the screen, where they had 32 participants. And they were survivors of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in Canada. And what was so sort of interesting about this research is listening or reading how much of an impact um, the cardiac arrest episode had on that individual's family who ended up witnessing the cardiac arrest. There's reports of nightmares, fear of reoccurrence, and in some cases, um, patients who have ended up purchasing their own AED to have at home because they're that sort of worried about having a- another cardiac event, which I think is probably very good in terms of improving survival, but it shows the kind of big impact these events sort of happen on and the the impact it has psychologically on patients. And then when we when you kind of turn to the qualitative evidence in this paper about individuals, what to them is a successful outcome from their cardiac arrest, the it's very much about how their recovery is and returning to what they would class as normality. And a big marker in that in patients who are still at working age is their ability to return to work their ability to return to hobbies and things that they previously enjoyed. And I think that's something that we do need to consider when making these decisions is, firstly, is there an element of futility? But equally, what does a successful outcome look for this patient? As I'm sure we all do in our practice, we'll be speaking to relatives, speaking to family members of these patients who are in arrest and asking sort of what would an acceptable level of outcome be for them? Would they wish to live with a level of disability? Have they had those conversations? But there's a lot of evidence around the kind of long term um, outcomes of patients following cardiac arrest. And it's well worth having a good look at. So we're now going to have a look at a number of different clinical factors that we may well consider when um, considering different clinical aspects that we may well use in our decision making to decide if actually it is futile to continue resuscitation attempts. So we're gonna have a look at ROSC, so whether a patient has achieved ROSC on scene. So the first paper is by Graf, and this was in 2019, and they did a prospective registry of all cardiac arrests that occurred in Holland during the sample sample period. And they were um, adults age 18 and above who'd had ROSC, or sorry, who'd not achieved ROSC on scene. So the sample had 2,437 patients, 1,782 had their resuscitation attempt terminated on scene. And this is the kind of important data for what we're looking at here today is that 655 were transported to hospital without a ROSC with ongoing CPR. And out of those 655 patients, 183 presented in PEA, and they had a 1% 30 day survival. And at the point of transport, so this is probably more so what we're thinking about tonight at the point of making that decision. Do we stop or do we transport through to hospital? 299 were in PEA and they had a 3% 30-day survival rate. And what they found was that patients who did not achieve a ROSC on scene had a higher chance of survival if the on-scene time was less than 20, 20 minutes. And that had a 7% survival for patients in PEA. And if the on-scene time was between 20 and 30 minutes, that was a 4% survival. And where the resuscitation or the on-scene time was longer than 30 minutes before conveying into hospital, the survival rate was 2%. And I think that's really important when we consider things like going through our reversible causes, that really this should be done as early as possible. And we really should potentially start with the reversible cause that we think 
most likely this patient has because there's limited benefit in 40 minutes of, of resuscitation potentially starting to think did this patient have a PE when there potentially is treatment available at the hospital or from a pre-hospital enhanced care team whereas if we've reduced our on-scene time we've been thinking about the most likely reversible cause very early as we can see from this data potentially the the, the smaller the on-scene time if we are going to convey this patient with PEA the more chance their uh, survival is. Uh, another study was by Yates. This was a UK study in the West Midlands, a very interesting retrospective cohort study where they essentially looked at patients in the West Midlands who did not achieve ROSC on scene but were conveyed to hospital with ongoing CPR. So 227 patients were identified, seven of which were deemed to have a potentially reversible cause of their cardiac arrest. Um, and at the arrival at um, the hospital, patients in this study received few specialist interventions that weren't available in the pre-hospital setting. And I think that's important to, to remember that in, in a number of patients, actually, there, there's nothing more that the hospital will provide um, than what we can already with good quality pre-hospital advanced life support. And in this study, um, most patients, unfortunately, did die in the, the emergency department. So out of the sample size, which we've already said was 227, 210 died in the ED, 17 were admitted to hospital, 14 to intensive care, but only three out of the 227 actually survived to hospital discharge, which was 1.3% of the sample. And as we said, all of those were conveyed to hospital with ongoing resuscitation and only 1.3% survived. And interestingly, of those 1.3% of survivors all presented in VF. There were no patients who presented in PEA or asystole at the initial rhythm assessment without a ROSC on scene that survived. So a further study is by Neem. They conducted a prospective study in Victoria, Australia. That was a sample of 1,035 out of hospital cardiac arrests. 255 of those were transported to hospital with ongoing CPR, where a ROSC was not achieved on scene or achieved on by arrival at hospital. And they again only had three survivors, which was 2.1% of the sample. And again, all of those three presented with an initial, initial shockable rhythm as opposed to a non-shockable rhythm. And then one last study on this uh, Ross section is by Grazner, and they completed a multi-center international prospective review. And this had a huge sample of 25,100, sorry, 171 patients and 11% were transported with ongoing CPR, and of that group, 4% were discharged alive. So I think what is important to consider with this research is that not achieving ROSC seems to be associated with a relatively poor outcome compared to those patients who we do achieve ROSC in, and that patients presenting in a non-shockable rhythm seem to have a worse outcome. So another factor that's that JAR Calc certainly less than other, um, and I'm sure many of us use in our sort of clinical decision making, is actually how long has the patient been in cardiac arrest for? So GOTO completed an observational study looking at the duration of CPR and neurological outcomes, and they found that a duration of CPR of less than 30 minutes was associated with good survival. And certainly if the, the patients had a um, duration of CPR for 20 minutes, that was equally associated with good survival and also favourable neurological outcome. What they found was that after 20 minutes of CPR, the probability of survival decreased from 36.8% to 4.6%. And for survival with favourable neurological outcome, if the resuscitation went over 20 minutes, that reduced to 21.8%. And if the resuscitation continued over 30 minutes, then the survival was 0.8% and with favourable neuro neurological outcome, 0.4%. And they found that no patient survived who had CPR for more than 54 minutes. And they found that to achieve more than 99% of survivors, the CPR duration um, was 35 minutes. And for patients who specifically presented with PEA, the, the, um, to get 99% of survivors was 34 minutes.
One further study was um, Sarinen. They completed a retrospective cohort study of FEM, so pre-hospital emergency medicine teams in Finland, and they had 99 patients who presented with their initial rhythm of PEA. And 41 of those had ROSC, 58 did not achieve ROSC. And the authors note that after 20 minutes, they still had a number of patients who had good neurological outcomes. So they had seven survivors and four of those had good neurological outcomes. And then one further study on this area is by Neem. And they had a interesting study. They had a sample of 1,035 patients who again presented in PEA. And they had a 0.9% of patients from that sample survived to hospital discharge. And they found that out of those 108 patients receiving resuscitation attempts over 40 minutes. So what we can see from this is that duration of cardiac arrest potentially has quite an impact on our likelihood of getting ROSC and equally our likelihood of neurological survival. But what, what is important important to note is that in some of these studies we did have unexpected survivors who as we saw in the first study by Goto of up to 54 minutes of resuscitation so I think this is why as we're seeing throughout all of these different clinical considerations is that a patient specific approach really is important because there are what you could class unexpected survivors. So looking at the presenting cardiac rhythm so how is this a consideration um, for, for our decision-making regarding PEA? So Bernard in 2019 did an observational cohort study in the UK and the east of England. So they had a sample of 9,109 cardiac arrest cases, 8,805 of which were medical cardiac arrest. And what they found is that in the medical cardiac arrest, arrest group, 1,862 participants had a first monitored rhythm of PEA, 1,697 for VF, 87 patients for VT, and 4,689 for asystole. They found that a presenting rhythm of asystole was noted to be statistically significant with a p-value of less than 0.001 for non-survivors. They had a 1.1 survival rate, sorry, percent survival rate, for hospital discharge from the presenting rhythm of asystole. Whereas for an initial rhythm of VF, this was statistically significant for survival. And this again had a reassuring p-value of 0.001, where 4.2% of patients survived a hospital discharge. And this was similar to the study from Yates we'd already mentioned, where they found that 1.3% of their, survive, of their um, sample, which were three patients survived, all of which presented in VF. And what they found that these patients required between five to eight fibrillation shocks and um, achieved ROSC. So one further study we've already sort of mentioned by Neem again, there's some interesting and multiple sort of um, aspects that come out of each of these large papers. They evidence how again presenting rhythm correlated with time to achieve ROSC. So Neem reports that patients presenting in VF and VT um, achieved ROSC in 70.2% of patients within 10 minutes of cardiac arrest, compared to 18.5% of patients who presented in PEA. So they found that patients were more likely to achieve ROSC quickly in a shockable rhythm compared to a non-shockable rhythm. And equally, um, another study by Graph, they reported how patients presenting in an initially shockable rhythm had an 89% 30-day survival compared to 11%, which was only three survivors in the non-shockable group. 291 of those patients presented in a non-shockable rhythm who were transported um, with ongoing CPR died, unfortunately, in hospital. So it's quite interesting that potentially the presenting rhythm may well be a clinical consideration for us, that actually if the patient's in a shockable rhythm, they are more likely to achieve ROSC and have a good outcome potentially compared to those patients in a non-shockable rhythm. But as we see, it does not mean that non-shockable rhythm has a dismal outcome as much as it potentially isn't as positive. There still are survivors, which again makes this decision about PEA so complex. So we talk a lot about PEA rates and um, width. There's quite a lot of evidence um, looking at this, but again, there is no real clear cut answer. So there's an interesting Austrian study by 
uh, visa and they essentially had um, a, a study where they had patients again over the age of 18 to so adult patients with non-traumatic cardiac arrest and PEA as their first presenting rhythm and this was from a, a Vienna um, cardiac arrest registry. So they found that by looking at these 405 patients who were suitable for analysis, that patients were essentially stratified into four different groups according to the electrical frequency of their PEA. So looking at the rate, essentially patients who presented initially with a PEA between 10 and 24 beats per minute, then they segregated down to 25 to 39, 40 to 59, and then patients who had a PEA at a rate of above 60 and essentially compared each of those different groups to mortality. And what they found was that the slower the PEA, the much higher the mortality. And they interestingly equally looked at QRS duration, but what they found quite interestingly in this study was that the QRS duration didn't particularly um, correlate to 30-day survival, whereas the um, heart rates certainly seem to be more predictive of survival. So they found that patients in the heart rate above 60 in their PEA group showed a 30-day survival of 22% and a good neurological outcome of 15% for all patients, which is quite interesting that in their study, it was more that the rate was more important as opposed to the um, QRS duration. And another study by um, Bergen, they again looked at in-hospital cardiac arrest episodes for adult patients in this was a Norwegian study and they essentially prospectively observed these episodes of PEA cardiac arrest and they found that abnormal ECG patterns were frequent in the early stages of PEA but they in this study did not find any particular pattern whether that was QRS duration or rate that actually was associated with neurological outcome or survival which again is quite interesting. And then one final paper on this area is by um, Skirkflo. And they essentially were patients of a um, in-hospital cardiac arrest again. And they essentially again looked at QRS complex and duration. And they essentially found that patients who had a narrow complex and a faster PEA were more likely to achieve ROSC. So they found that during their cardiac arrest, if the PEA changed to an increasing rate and a reducing QRS complex, that they were more likely to achieve a ROSC. So what is important really here is that we potentially use this as a consideration, but actually, as you've seen, the evidence is not clear cut. There's a mix of some studies saying that the, the rate and the width are essential. Other studies are saying that it's less predictive. So again, it adds to the complexity of these decisions. So going on to bystander CPR as a consideration in our decision-making process. So Huang in 2021 completed a retrospective observational analysis of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. They had a big sample of 4,188 adult cardiac arrests, and they essentially looked at how bystander CPR potentially affects outcome. And they use some multivariant logistic regression calculations to kind of ascertain for other positive prognostic confounding factors for positive outcomes in cardiac arrest. And they found that bystander CPR did not significantly contribute to survival to discharge, and that had a p-value of 0.122. But what they do know is that bystander CPR made a big difference in neurological survival. So for patients who did achieve ROSC, bystander CPR was very predictive of a better neurological outcome than those patients who did not um, receive bystander CPR. And furthermore, in the Bernard study um, in, back in the UK that we've already mentioned, the kind of research um, methodology around that, they found that medical cardiac arrest bystander CPR rates in their study was 54.6%. And they concluded that bystander CPR seemed to offset prolonged initial pre-hospital response times for neurological outcome. So for when we've kind of been or had a delayed response to these patients, they then found that bystander CPR was beneficial for neurological outcome, but not necessarily survival. And equally in the graph study that we've already mentioned, they equally looked at um, bystander CPR rates. And they note again that bystander CPR didn't particularly 
impact clinicians' decision regarding transport terminating on scene. They found that 81% of patients who did not achieve ROSC and died on scene received CPR, and equally 81% of patients who did not achieve the ROSC and were transported to CPR of ongoing um, resuscitation received bystander CPR. So they're kind of saying that actually did um, bystander CPR rates alter the decision-making of the clinicians on scene and they're saying potentially not in this study. But what they did say is that those patients who um, were transported to hospital of ongoing resuscitation who did not receive bystander CPR, 16% died and 31% survived at 30 days. So as really with all the other clinical factors, there's a mixed evidence base, certainly for bystander CPR, of how impactful is it for survival but it certainly seems quite clear that it's impactful for positive neurological survival. So what's the cardiac arrest witness? This is something that, again, um, is potentially something that we may well consider when deciding if we're going to terminate resuscitation. So in Barnard's study, they had that um, for witness cardiac arrest, 5% survived hospital discharge, whereas for patients who had an unwitnessed cardiac arrest, only 1% survived. And they found that survival to hospital arrival, so patients who had a ROSC on arrival at ED, 19.9% were witnessed, compared to only 7.6% for unwitnessed cardiac arrest. And they found that that was statistically significant for survival to admission and for discharge from hospital. And similarly with the GRAF study, the patients who had a witnessed cardiac arrest were more likely to be transported to hospital, compared to unwitnessed cardiac arrest, where 47% had resuscitation terminated on scene, and only 21% were transported to hospital with ongoing resuscitation. And they found that witness cardiac arrests um, only had a 50% um, resuscitation terminated on scene. So for patients who had a witnessed arrest, 50% achieved a ROSC and were transported to hospital. So it's interesting that if you have a witness cardiac arrest, you are much, much, as you can imagine, more likely to achieve ROSC. So this is something that we really should consider when making our decisions potentially to terminate PEA cardiac arrest that actually was the cardiac arrest witnessed because that can have a big impact, as we know, on presenting rhythm and on likelihood of survival. So one interesting additional um, aspect to consider is the etiology. So does actually the potential cause of the cardiac arrest um, or should that impact our decision-making when um, making these decisions? So Andrew in 2014 investigated the survival outcomes for asystole and PEA cardiac arrest. Again, a huge sample for this paper, 38,378 resuscitation attempts. And they noticed how, or noting how the etiology of the cardiac arrest, regardless of presenting rhythm, was associated with outcome. And they provided evidence that if the cause was respiratory overdose trauma or hanging etiology, then the outcome was statistically significant. So actually, those etiologies did seem to be more predictive of a poor outcome compared to patients who had a presumed cardiac cause of their cardiac arrest. And equally, um, Bernard, um, in their study, they essentially compared different successful determinants of resuscitation in, in their non-traumatic cardiac arrest group they found there were a number of different positive and negative um, determinants and etiology was within that and was statistically significant for survival. So on this slide, really, we're talking about is assessing potentially what has caused the cardiac arrest going to impact the patient's uh, survival and something that we should really consider with our decision making. So on to comorbidities. So Huang, as we've already discussed, paper in 2021 was a retrospective observational analysis and they essentially looked at pre-hospital prognostic factors associated with survival and they reviewed 4,188 out of hospital cardiac arrests and they essentially compared patients who were aged below 75 and patients who were aged over 75 and assessed whether both age or comorbidities impacted survival and they demonstrated that comorbidities in their study were not statistically significant impact survival to hospital discharge or favourable neurological outcome. But what they did say is that potentially advancing age in the group of over 75 potentially may have impacted, but that's, that um, 
sort of statistical powering wasn't actually that significant. Whereas Serinan conducted a retrospective observational study of factors again influencing survival and the level of hospital care patients receive when they arrive into ED. And they noted how comorbidity independently was not statistically significant to correlate to outcome. However, what they do know was that pre-arrest function was statistically significant to outcome and that pre-arrest cerebral performance had a statistically significant p-value of less than 0.001 and a pre-arrest performance in terms of what was their level of frailty and what was their general activities of sort of general daily living was again predictive potentially of survival. So this slide was quite interesting and certainly comorbidities that actually how a patient's frailty and how their pre-arrest performance is potentially more statistically useful than actually necessarily individual comorbidities when making these decisions. So there's a number of qualitative studies rather than all quantitative looking at how paramedics potentially make these decisions to terminate um, resuscitation in the pre-hospital environment. So Brandling has done a really interesting qualitative study looking at paramedics when they're making their decisions to terminate resuscitation. They did a number of interviews with um, a number of different types of clinicians, those in specialist roles and some um, in frontline um, ambulance work. And they found that local policy guidelines and protocols seem to very much so influence their decision making. Interestingly, distance to hospital was quite influential. And then interpersonal um, aspects such as um, teamwork, so potentially there may have been one individual clinician on scene who were very pro continuing resuscitation and they found that actually that was quite challenging, that potentially when there was a lot of evidence that patients would not benefit from continued resuscitation, but actually overcoming those CRM issues on scene potentially can create um, not conflict, but difficulties when making these uh, decisions. And equally, they found that exposure and experience seem to improve decision making, as you would expect. And equally, they found that there were a lot of concerns regarding litigation and potentially getting the decision wrong. And in sort of quotes, there were phrases from the um, transcription, such as it's easier just to transport. And that was in relation to sort of worries around litigation if the decision was wrong. And one further study, again, looking at this was Coppola. And this was, again, how senior paramedics um, seem to use more clinical factors to decide um, when to terminate resuscitation. So they essentially highlighted how team confidence and also cultural factors impact how us as clinicians make our decisions when potentially um, withdrawing resuscitation. And certainly when the patient was younger, we had a much higher threshold for terminating resuscitation. And there was quite an interesting part of one of the transcripts about balancing the right of a dignified death against concerns, again, regarding litigation or disciplinary action. And I think that's probably a larger part of work around culture and things that we're going to need to do to overcome uh, things like that. So, um, again, it's quite interesting, as we've sort of already discussed, that there's a lot of considerations here that we need to um, factor into our clinical decision making. So there's a other potential consideration. So we've kind of looked at some of the clinical evidence, which again is very mixed as we're discussing in a moment. We've looked at some of the non-clinical considerations, but equally there are other potential considerations such as echo, POCUS and end tidal. So there's some evidence base to suggest that a downtrending, reduced kind of value and tidal capnography is associated with a poor outcome but again the uh, there are multiple things as we all know that can affect our capnography uh, readings whether that's the etiology of the cardiac arrest the quality of cpr there's many things as we know that could potentially give us a false um, low reading of that and equally echo i think there's a use in it absolutely so we can work out whether there is pea with no cardiac movement at all or PEA with cardiac movement. But I think for echo to be useful in out of hospital cardiac arrest, it must be by a skilled operator. Because if you scan the, scan the heart and there's a very slight bit of movement, that potentially causes more confusion on scene because actually what is the definition of meaningful cardiac movement? So it must be undertaken by a skilled operator to be safe. So 
that I'm sure as as sort of time and technology moves on and paramedic education, probably POCUS and point of care ultrasound will become much more common in standard paramedic practice. But it's just something to consider that actually it, it potentially isn't the answer to everything at the moment because the, the level of training to interpret the images correctly is really, really important. And there's some interesting papers here that I'll direct you towards um, to, to have a look at in your own time. So essentially, um, PA cardiac arrest has many factors for us to consider. We know it's complex. We've looked at some of the evidence. And as I hope you've appreciated, there's no real clear answer. A number of these factors we've considered, so presenting rhythm, the duration of the cardiac arrest, the rate and width, the comorbidities, the baseline function and frailty the patient has are all things we can potentially consider. And what we're really looking to do is decide, is this futile in terms of survival in terms of their cardiac arrest management? So we're not potentially focused exactly on the rhythm. What we're building really is a picture that this patient has been in cardiac arrest, let's say, for 45 minutes. They have a very high level of frailty. They've had X number of adrenaline. Their PA is at a rate of 15. It's a wide complex. They've had no bystander CPR. Their presenting rhythm was asystole. The evidence potentially would support terminating that cardiac arrest. Whereas, as we've seen, a patient who has had a witnessed arrest presented in VF, who potentially has an identifiable reversible cause, is a patient who we need to aggressively manage with advanced life support and reduce our on scene time as much as possible. And another consideration, as we know, is extrication. Where, where are we? Is there a good chain of survival? Are we an hour away from the local ED? What's the extrication like? As we know, these decisions are very nuanced and the evidence at the moment is not as clear cut for patients who are persistently and continuously in asystole. That decision is fairly well established in practice and we know that, that is a safe decision um, to make when we're considering termination decisions. But PEA certainly still does present a big clinical dilemma and there is national work going on um, with some sort of large studies, I believe, in the pipeline to try and assist us to know which patients can we safely terminate resuscitation and which patients will benefit from um, ongoing resuscitation care into hospital. So, as we said, futility in PEA may be identifiable in the pre-hospital setting, but it is a complex clinical decision where certainly clinical uncertainty does still exist due to a lack of evidence. Um, as we said, we can't take one factor in isolation. So we can't take one of those clinical findings and say that definitely means a poor outcome. Because as we've seen, there are survivors in PEA up to huge amounts of sort of time in cardiac arrest. So we need to make a clinical decision regarding futility based on a multitude of different factors. Shared decision making is fundamental that certainly as frontline ambulance clinicians it's um, very wise to share our clinical decision making as we all know and that certainly for PA where there is this level of clinical uncertainty it's been sort of reported in evidence that sharing that clinical decision making ensures that people who are potentially remote from the scene are not biased by any sort of on-scene factors and that really is essential and good clinical governance and peer review and case review is essential for these cases. And as we know, there are unexpected neurologically intact survivors and that this should be a patient-centred individual approach. And as we've kind of discussed in, in this hour-long session, there's obviously many limitations to the research papers that have been presented that we obviously haven't had time to sort of critically appraise each paper. But it's important to know that a lot of these studies potentially were not based with this population, maybe international, had small sample sizes. So it's really important that we sort of take that into consideration when using the current available evidence um, to inform our clinical decisions. So the sort of final take home message really is that it's potentially more of a focus on the patient alongside the rhythm. And we're really looking for evidence of futility for survival as opposed to a sole focus on the rhythm itself. And that shared clinical decision-making is essential with the team on scene, the family and a senior clinician 
um, whether that's remote or somebody that arrives on scene to assist us.